if you want to make your own podcast but feel intimidated by the tech barriers, then you might need Alitu. Alitu is a web app that lets you create and publish great sounding podcast episodes. It takes care of the complicated stuff, leaving you free to concentrate on what you do best, talking about your passion. Alitu, the podcast maker app, find it at alitu.com. That's A-L-I-T-U dot com. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. I'm your host, Josh Rapoon. Today is the second edition of Quick Kind Bites, episodes which feature folks outside of Hawaii who are leaders in education. These episodes are designed to be quick, in other words, you could listen on your morning walk or commute, and energetic examinations of the important education issues of the day. In the first Quick Kind Bite, we talked to middle school expert Chris Baum. Today, we are talking with Stephanie Malia Kraus, who just released her first book titled Making It, What Today's Kids Need for Tomorrow's World. Stephanie Malia is a mom with a background in education and social work. Through her experiences teaching and running a school, she realized that getting young people to graduate does not always mean they are ready for life. This was true in her own life. As a high school dropout, she needed people and opportunities within and beyond school to prepare her for adulthood. Stephanie Malia, who is Native Hawaiian, works at the intersection of education, human services, and workforce development. Her work focuses on what young people and their families need to survive and thrive now and in the future. She is a senior advisor to Jobs for the Future and a staff consultant for the Youth Transition Funders Group. Learn more about her work and ways to collaborate with her at stephaniemaliakraus.com. And now, here's my quick kind bite with Stephanie Malia Kraus, author of Making It. Stephanie Malia Kraus, welcome to the show. Aloha, Josh. So glad to be here. Awesome. So, hey, I'm going to set a clock for 40 minutes because this is a quick, kind bite, and we're going to try to keep it relatively quick. So when the timer goes off, we have to quit. We have to stop. Um, uh, either that or we'll run out of questions, um, which I don't think is going to happen because I literally have like a thousand questions to, a- to ask you, but that's okay. We will We will quit at the 40-minute mark, okay? Sounds good. I just set my own timer. Awesome. Okay, here we go. So let's talk for a minute about your personal journey. What is the most relevant part of your background we need to know about you before we dive into your book? From an education perspective, um, there's one answer. And then I think there's an answer around like, who, who am I? Um, as a human. So who am I as an educator? The most important thing you should know about me is that I had to leave school in order to love it. I dropped out at 16. The last actual year I completed fully of K-12 was the eighth grade, which is crazy because I went on to run a high school and have spent the last 10 years working nationally with folks who are trying to reimagine it. Um, So as you can imagine, that is one journey that we could go into deeply, Um, but for brevity's sake and understanding that you are recording right now in Hawaii, Mm -hmm. um, the other piece to know about me is that I am deeply steeped in um, the culture and communities that I come from, which includes being Native Hawaiian and Jewish, growing up in New Jersey and having the opportunity Um, to go to school in the South and then teach a mostly migrant population in the Southwest and raise my boys in the Midwest. Um, And those communities and cultures that have um, really sort of either are a part of my DNA or a part of my growing up have grafted themselves into me. So as a writer and educator and human, Um, I think you should know that I see myself as a carrier of stories, not only mine, but of all of the folks I've gotten to journey with so Mm -hmm. far. 
Awesome. And so just a real quick fact here in the beginning, you ran a school. What school was that? And when did you run it? So, oh, I'm not going to get the years right, but um, I ran it starting about 10 years ago. Okay. Um, and it was called Shearwater High School, and it was for, it was a charter school um, that was opened with the support of the public school district in St. Louis in Missouri, and it was for youth who were over age and undercredited. So these were kids who had been pushed or pulled out of school or who had dropped out, and we were on a technical college campus. Mm. Um, before running a school, I had been a classroom teacher. I taught fifth grade. I started in pre-K. So I have gone pre-K all the way up to this school on a community college campus. Right. Got it. Okay, so you know, one more question related to your background. Um, when you were 16, you moved from New Jersey to Florida. And one of the things that happened in Florida is that you entered AA meetings. And I found it really remarkable that you shared this so openly with your readers. So what was going through your mind, Stephanie Malia, as you decided to include or not include that section? I'm glad you asked um, because – Sobriety is a funny thing and it's a private thing so often. And in fact, people are encouraged uh, never to speak on behalf of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I which I don't think that I did. But um, I was in my teens when I got sober and started going to AA. And what I've learned is that um, in terms of the way that young people's brains are, that you're technically in adolescence, you're a young person until you're 25. And so one of the reasons I wanted to talk about getting sober so young in the book was because those really formative years, those like high school aged years, I spent in in recovery and with people who were really different from me, it was in Palm Beach. And so many of them were quite wealthy, which is what I talk about in the book. Um, and so much of the, the world as I saw it and possibility of what I could be um, and what school could be changed and evolved because I was living alongside these other people who were as broken and normal as I was because they were in recovery um, from addiction, but also had had these really rich and different life experiences. So I wanted to point out to folks how much learning can happen outside of the classroom. For me, so much learning about life um, happened inside of the rooms of AA. And then because I've been sober as long as I have, and have had the opportunity to be a, a sober educator and a sober mom, um, I, I felt comfortable sharing that mm. and comfortable in how to share it. Mm, that's, that's super interesting. Um, so we are going to move rapid fire through a series of questions about your book, Making It, which just was released today, which is incredible. And I'm so privileged to be talking to you today um, as a new author. So um, Karen Pittman, in a forward to your book, called you a force of nature, which is pretty cool. And she cited a project that, and I quote, created a universal list of competencies youth need to succeed that speaks clearly to young people, resonates with leaders across multiple systems, from education to juvenile justice, and is grounded in everything we know about learning and development. So what was the genesis of this competencies project? So I mentioned I had to keep leaving school to love it and to love learning. Um, so first that happened myself when I dropped out, but I also have the painful and important experience of closing the high school I mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. um, so we were operating a school for 17 to 21 year olds who needed to be ready for college and work and adult life. And they would enroll in our high school. And we had a million requirements from the state of Missouri of what it meant to graduate with a Missouri high school diploma, including that every unit of credit, you needed to be in your seat in a classroom, in a school building for 7,820 minutes. And the wow. math did add up. And so I was in this moral conflict of 
a group of young people who really believed in earnest that if they got a diploma from me, it meant that they were ready for life. And I knew that the requirements of graduating high school and what it actually took to be ready for what comes after high school were not always compatible. In fact, they rarely were. And in this case, they were not at all. Um, and so the we had developed the first competency-based high school in the state of Missouri um, and had come up with this model called 21 by 21. It was the 21 competencies young people needed before the state would stop paying for them to be in school, which was their 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. And um, we couldn't do it. We could not do the model that we knew was best for the young people we were serving. Mm -hmm. And there was a missional conflict and we closed the school. It's a different conversation, but I can tell you we did it deliberately with the support of the community. Young people were well taken care of in the transition and it was still hard. And during that time, Karen Pittman, who called me that force of nature, um, reached out. She was working. She had founded and was leading an organization in Washington, D.C. And they had for a long time been asking the same question I was in the closure of the school, which is what actually does readiness require for life? Not how do you graduate high school? How do you complete a program? How do you finish something? But what actually does readiness require? Mm. And so she invited me to join her. And so in that closure, I transitioned from local to national work. And we went to the Ford Foundation and asked if they would give us time to dive into the science of learning and child and human development um, and talk to everyone from employers, to educators, to pediatricians, compare all of the different lists, the social emotional learning skills, the competencies, 21st century skills, employability skills, you know, all of these, these different sets of things that people say are important for kids and then push it against the science. Mm -hmm. And what emerged was a publication that Dated the book that we're talking about, and mm. it was called Ready by Design. Um, and it was the science and art of youth readiness. So, um, you know, making it as a book, and Karen talks about this is sort of the delivery on a down payment. It started with mm. 21 by 21 in school leadership with a bunch of academic content requirements that were cumbersome and that weren't always what was most important for kids. And then shifted into the readiness project at the Forum for Youth Investment with Ready by Design, looking across all of these systems and sectors and the science to say what is really most important. And then this thir third step has been writing a book um, and trying to do it in a way that is fun and enjoyable for folks to read, where it's the continuation of that question of mm. what, what actually do young people need to be ready um, to learn and to work and to live in a changing world. Got it. So, so Maria Flynn in another forward to your book wrote, and I quote, in order to reimagine education and work, we must embrace change from within our systems and drive change outside of them. What did she mean? Maria is my boss at Jobs for the Future at JFF, and she talks about taking a dual transformation approach. Um, and among folks who are committing to abolitionist work, I have heard something similar, which is a recognition that the schools and systems that young people are in are inequitable, they're flawed, they're outdated, and young people are still in them every day. And educators are still working in them every day. And there is a need to optimize what is possible inside of these broken systems mm. and to push on the bounds of what's possible. Mm. But there's also a need to design from the outside the kind of learning that is steeped in how we're designed to learn and grow and develop and be curious. Mm. Um, and that you have to do both at once. You have to meet young people where they are, even as you're building for something better. 
one of the things I talk about in making it, and it's it's a risky move, I think, is I am a big believer in the chance for young people to thrive and flourish. But I also, like the pragmatist in me, I wanted to be able to provide a roadmap for educators, parents, coaches, counselors, anybody raising or working with young people for how do you how do you help young people get the education and preparation they need in a world and in systems that are still unfair and unjust, even as you're building a better world? And what does that dual call look like of what Maria talks about, both um, working to optimize what you can from the inside and also aggressively building new on mm. the outside? Right. Right. Okay. Awesome. So then, perfect segue. Um, your book is grounded in an essential question, which is, what does it take to ensure young people are ready? And my question is, ready for what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh my gosh. Have you seen the world recently? Ready for what is right? Um, so two things. One, I'm so glad you said essential question. Grant Wiggins was a, a dear friend and mentor of mine, and he gets a really big shout out in the book. And he taught me um, in in terms of like designing from the outside to just at basic, he wrote, this is a guy who, as you know, wrote thousands of pages of of books. And he used to, we would sit in a bagel shop with napkins trying to design my school, mm. just rearranging these napkins. And he would say, you know, Stephanie, what does the world look like for these kids if, if things go right? And that's where you start. And then you build back from there. Um, and what are the characteristics of a young person then who is, who has the opportunity to have this decent and good life? Um, so for me, ready for what is ready for adulthood in a rapidly changing world. So what I really wanted to know was for any young person, uh, what do they need for, so this was, this was crazy, Josh. Like one of the things that came out in the research is that kids who are born today will live to be, if they have the right resources and supports, a hundred years old. Mm -hmm. They will have 100 year old life. And, and so for me, it was moving the, the end point. Uh, we talk about college and career readiness in schools. And I actually think that we need to be talking about long and livable lives. Like how do we not just get young people college and career ready, but how do we get them ready for the possibility of an 80 year work life? Right. of 90 years of adulthood. What do they need in the first 25 years, the first quarter of life to be ready for the rest of it? And some of those things, like the ability to um, have really healthy, vibrant relationships or creativity and innovation, they have to be built in childhood. Right. Those building blocks start so early. So my perspective always is what do young people need now? What do they need next? And what do they need in the future? And what is that progression um, that will enable them to enjoy and be okay in their life today, but is also setting them up for success in adulthood wow. and in a very long adulthood? Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. So, okay. So in chapter one, you consider today's kids, how they are wired by their experiences, what they care about, what makes them so different from the rest of us. So what makes kids so different from us? I have two boys. Um, Justice Hi'ilani is 10 and Harrison Drew Ko'oli'i, we call him Koa, is just about eight. Um, his birthday is March 12th. And I bring that up because March 13th of 2020 is when there was a national emergency declared and our world shut down. And so Justice was born in 2010 and Koa was born in 2012 um, or 2013. And both of them were born years after 
the smartphone came out, which is 2007. Um, Their births were announced on Facebook. I started their digital like journey footprint without their permission while they were in the womb. Um, They are complete digital natives and they are disruption natives. This is their childhood. The and I say it in the book, the first time that Justice got on a school bus was to practice an active shooter drill. Wow. They have grown up in a time of extreme weather and climate change. Um, they have now survived their first pandemic and potentially not their last. And and they only know a world with... Um, digital devices around them, surrounding them, and a world that really relies on internet. And what's important to understand there is that this is all that they know, and it will get progressively busier and more complex. Mm. And so the question is, like, what does that mean for them? And what does that mean for their futures? And so for them, one of the things to know is that the brain is wired and rewired based on the experiences we have and the environments that we're in. And so they are being um, shaped, neurologically shaped, physically um, shaped, emotionally, mentally shaped by these experiences. If If you are a high school senior this year or last year, it means that you were born right after 9-11. You started kindergarten in the middle of the Great Recession, and you're going into college or the workforce or adulthood in the middle of COVID. And so you've got these bookended pieces. Um, And and so what that means, just briefly, and I give it a really deep treatment, I hope, in the book, is that as digital and disruption natives, these are young people who are, by design, very innovative and creative. They're also the first majority minority group of young people that we've ever had. Um, They are primed for activism and advocacy like we saw after Parkland. Mm -hmm. Um, But they're also deeply concerned and afraid for their lives. Mm -hmm. And they want a promise of security and stability, which we can't promise them because because of 2020, because of everything that we're seeing in this moment. Right. Um, and so it's a very it's a very different group of young people who are coming up right now. Mm. Awesome. So so listen, Stephanie Malia, we have to make a deal here because I'm already realizing I'm never going to get anywhere close to the end of the questions that I have to ask you. So how about this? Let's do this as a part one, and then we'll have you come back um, soon for part two. Um, And in the meantime, lots of folks will actually have bought the book and we'll start to read it and we'll do the rest of it. And that takes all the pressure off. Is, is that okay? Sounds good. And I'll, I'll work to be briefer. (laughs) No, No. brevity is a learned skill. (laughs) It is. That's right. But, but, but no, we don't want you to be too brief. So, okay, we have a deal. All right. So continuing on. Um, And, and and again, a, a great segue. So in chapter two, you examine, our rapidly changing world and workplace, which you were just talking about. And you explore how machines and sheer momentum and an evolving market are reshaping how we live and how we learn and how we work. So how are we living, learning, and working as compared to when I went to Punahou School here in Honolulu back in the 70s? Mm. Well, um, Certainly different than Punahou in the 70s, for sure. Um, This is the chapter in tomorrow's world for any educator or parent who is listening right now. This is the thing that made me decide to write a book Mm. because when I was in the classroom, there was no way that I had time or even knew what questions to ask about how the world, um, how the economy how the markets or the workplace were changing. And what I want you to hear and understand is the way that we think about college and careers or career pathways um, is 
is different than how it's actually working right now. So I've been out of the classroom, off front lines for eight years, and I've been in these national positions working on workforce and higher education issues in addition to young people. And what I've learned is not only will the kinds of jobs that young people have be changing rapidly, and when we can talk about that for a hot second here in just a moment, um, but what I said about this like prospect of a 100-year life, mm-hmm. for young people who have the chance to live a long life and there's a lot of um, a lot of details to dig into to from an equity perspective, who gets the possibility and promise of a long life? What do you need to have? Who's most likely to have it? But if you if you live that long life, an 80 year working life is a lifetime of work. If you think about how long people are living right now as compared to these kids. Mm-hmm. And the chances are that our kids, and when I say kids, I mean everybody sort of 20 and younger, um, they will have multiple careers, uh, upwards of 20 or more jobs, and often more than one job at a time. So there are all different types of work. And then in relationship to technology, with the rise of things like artificial intelligence and big data, these are young people who are going to be working right alongside technology or even working for technology. So you might have a job like uh, being a craftsman, you know, you're um, you're living in Hawaii, you're making um, jewelry, and you're using Etsy in order to sell your goods, and right. you rely on technology. Um, or a gig worker who relies on that Instacart app. But you also have the potential that jobs up to and including lawyers and some doctors could one day be taken over mm. by our Artificial intelligence. And so the big thing here, I think, for folks to know from the chapter is first, you know, read it. I think this is new information for a lot of educators and parents and a good way to understand beyond sort of CTE and really technical career pathways conversations, just what is the future of work. Um, You know, number one, the relationship with technology is evolving, changing, and increasingly important. And the best thing for kids to be is human, mm. are the things that aren't predictable um, and that are truly like craftsmen. That's number one. And I dig in more there um, in the book. Number two, we feel the overwhelm and the overload of how fast everything is moving and changing. A good example of this is I had to rewrite my preface for this book mm. five times because yeah. the world was changing. <laughs> so fast. Fast. Right. right? Yeah. Um, and so that is, that's sort of the, the situation. And so being able to raise young people to, to be able to, live and learn and work in the speed of things is the second. And very quickly, the third would be that the post-secondary market has actually changed. So because we are learning and working for so long, our success is actually, or our kids' success is going to be on their ability to continuously update and Mm. upgrade what they know and can do. Mm. Are they learn are they lifetime learners can they continuously learn and go back to school or go back into a training program to keep recreating themselves in this market um so that they can make it mm. wow you know this is so interesting and just as an aside um yesterday i interviewed a head of school of a small independent school here in East Oahu Holy Nativity School her name is Jeannie Wilkes and she said something at the end that just really struck me um she described how her faculty over the course of this pandemic year had to become learners again where they didn't 
necessarily have to before that, right? They did their thing. And then all of a sudden this pandemic hits and they were all forced into becoming learners because they had to figure out how to do education differently. And I'm just you know, struck by that idea that the pandemic has created this, this wrinkle in time that's forced us, the adults, as compared to the kids who've, you know, been in it for a while now, to actually learn. And that maybe the long-term effect of that is that we will have a greater respect for lifelong learning, especially in a life that's going to last maybe a hundred years. You know, what do you, what do you think about that? I think, That's right. I think all of us need to be prepared for a long lifetime of learning and work. And if we can't come at it with a posture of what do I still need to know? What don't I know? And who knows what I don't know? um, Then we'll be in trouble. And, And that is a big shift to move from, let me show you what I know and can do to let me show you what I know and can do and can continue to learn to know and do. Mm. Um, And with young people, what that means is they actually have to learn how to learn and how to persist and struggle and recreate and define themselves. You know, you've been a leader in Hawaii at thinking about innovation and creativity and um, reimagining. And there is an aspect of young people having to be ready to reimagine and redefine themselves and their relationships over a long period of time. Um, I'll say one other piece there, which is what that means for our young people who are thinking about next year, maybe they're about to graduate. The time horizon needs to adjust from what do I want to be when I grow up to what do I want to do next Mm. or for a while, um, because there will be opportunity to kind of go back into this post-secondary marketplace and do something different after doing one thing for a bit. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So awesome. So let's let's do a specific example. Um, Jennifer Silva is a pediatric cardiologist. Um, and how does she fit into your book, Making It, that you just released today? I love Jen Silva so much. So this is um, this is my children's doctor. Our family has a heart condition that we're all monitored for. Not sure we have it, but we know somebody does. And so she she sees my boys every year. Um, she, like me, is a mom of two. And her husband is a tech entrepreneur. Um, And she has mastered how to use technology in a way that makes her a better doctor while still being fully human. And so I use this story in the book because I think that it's such a powerful one where she's kind of pioneering the kind of relationship with technology that I think will be emblematic of what our kids have um, moving forward. She works on little people's hearts. So you can imagine like there's nothing scarier (laughs) or more, um, intense than holding a child's heart and life in your hands. And what she realized was she needed an opportunity to practice procedures without actually opening up a little person. And um, she had no way of doing that until her tech entrepreneur husband went to a conference and saw somebody wearing a HoloLens, a virtual reality, augmented reality pair of goggles and playing with something virtually. And he imagined a technology where Jen um, could and fellow pediatric cardiologists could put on goggles and actually see the hearts that they were going to be operating on and that they could practice and train using the technology um, before the procedure. And so they did it. They founded a company and developed the technology. And I, I include it in the book, but I'll say it here because it's so powerful At the end of our conversation of talking about this relationship with technology um, in healthcare and her perspective as a mom and a doctor, I asked Jen if she thought 
robots would ever take over in the operating room because robots can be very accurate and precise. And she said, you know, I think, Stephanie, that if I didn't use every technology possible to me, you would never forgive me. Mm. And if I was not in that operating room with your child, navigating with a human heart and a human mind and back out with you in the hospital room, holding your hand as a fellow mom, you would also never forgive me. Mm. And that interplay um, was, she was exactly right. I wouldn't, I would never forgive her if she knew of a technology that could save my kid's life and didn't use it. Mm. And yet I need her as a full human holding my hand and walking through that experience with me. Wow. You know, as I was reading your manuscript, if you will, um, that's the story that really locked and loaded me. That's where I really got pulled in um, because it became very, the whole thing that you're working on here, the essential question that you're working on became very real at that point. Um, so I'm I'm encouraging people to get the book because you actually have peppered your book with these kinds of stories and they're very meaningful. Um, so th that's awesome. So we have we have time for a couple more. So part of what you talk about in your book is currencies, which is a term, frankly, I had not heard in the context of education. Um, so these currencies are competencies, connections, credentials, and cash. So could you explain this a bit more? And then I'll have a follow-up question for you. Yeah. Um, thanks for bringing that up. And just to your stories piece, I know how busy it is to be a parent, to be a teacher, to be a coach, to be a counselor. And I really wanted to write something that was enjoyable and easy to read because life is hard and we don't have a lot of time. Um, so I'm really glad that you grabbed onto Jen's story. And I, I did try to share um, a lot like that throughout the book. The currencies are a new term, and I'm challenging folks in this book to become currency builders. Um, and the idea here, I'll just tee it up and folks can read about it more in the book, is that in the in the past, so go back to Punahou in the 70s, the idea at Punahou um, and elsewhere was you need to graduate from high school and go to university get a degree from university and get a job, get better jobs, make increasingly more money, and at some point retire and give back to your kids. Um, and that is already like a deeply flawed and inequitable social contract. It has never worked for everyone. But at this point, it's also just like totally out of date. It doesn't work for anyone anymore. And the reason why is when kids leave high school, and they go into the post-secondary world, they're entering the super complex post-secondary marketplace that's full of education and work vendors who are offering now not only degrees, but certificates and micro-credentials and badges and internships and apprenticeships and part-time jobs and full-time jobs. Um, and how you, how you get one of those opportunities is actually being a consumer. Now, for the social justice warriors who are tuning into this podcast, I am not a promoter of capitalism. I did want to provide a really clear, accurate roadmap of how this world works. So flawed, unfair, unjust, it is all of those things. And it is also the way that opportunities happen right now, which is the more money you have, the, the more people you know, has as much or more to do with what opportunities you can get for college placements, for jobs or internships, as having a credential and having the right skills or competencies. And in the past, what we have told young people, particularly those who are poor and um, who are already held back because of racism, injustice, oppression, other things, is if you just have the right skills and you just get your credential, you will be okay. But it's not actually the way the world operates. People really care 
if you know someone they know, or if you bring social capital to the table, or if you can either afford to purchase an opportunity or for afford to do something for free, like an unpaid internship that then gets you in to a better job down the road. A kid without resources is not going to be able to take that on. So what I wanted to do, Josh, was to really make clear that young people actually need to acquire skills and credentials, competencies and credentials, but they also, social relationships and cash are fundamental. And if we are about educating and preparing young people for life after high school, we actually have to care about that. Mm. But that those things for us as adults, you know, Josh and, and Stephanie as adults here, mm-hmm. we are also using those to take on new opportunities and we spend them down and then we have to acquire new So if I have a skills gap or a competency gap, I've got to get training in it. If I run out of money, I need more money. Hmm. Um, So that that was what I was really focused on with the currencies. Wow, that's so interesting. So so look, um, I'm going to save the follow up question to be the lead question for part two. Um, And I just want to tell everybody listening that in part two. Um, some of the things that I want to talk about with you have to do with what you call living in an open source society. I want to talk about Tom Friedman's phrase, the age of acceleration, and something you call momentum. Um, I also want to talk about how we're shifting from a white collar, blue collar paradigm to something entirely different, um, and about what it means to be a you know a worker. Um, in tomorrow, and I also want to, uh, you know, in the in in tomorrow and going forward for that long life, I also want to talk about some things that you write about related to um, being hyper connected but totally alone, um, which I found mm. completely fascinating. And I also want to ask you a couple of very curmudgeonly cranky questions about the College Board and the 1.3 trillion dollars worth of college debt that our um, 30 million Americans hold. But we'll hold that <laughs> for part two, right? So I want to. I want to end. We're gonna we're gonna buy a few extra minutes here, and I just want to end with this question for you, um, Stephanie Malia. So I would love for you to tell our listeners how writing this book changed you personally, and how your views and ideas shifted as you researched and wrote the book. In other words, how did the process reshape you, and in what ways did you remain fixed on a core element that was you? Hmm. Thank you for that question. And I can't wait for, <laughs> for part two. Number two. Yes. <laughs> I know those are great questions. Um, oh gosh. Okay. So number one, how did this change me? As a mom and educator, I was rocked by this idea of a 100 year life. And it be, for all of the implications of like, how do you how do you financially afford a 100 year life? And how do you work for 80 years at a time? And what is actually most important? So for instance, I think we're on the cusp of an incredible mental health crisis and I'm really terrified about it for our kids. And if the if the focus is a long and livable life and not college and career readiness, I mean, college and career readiness is important, but also we have to keep this bigger picture in mind Then attending to mental health needs right now is imperative. You, you can't do that um, without the rest. So number one was really thinking about like, how do we move from talking about achievement gaps and skills gaps and opportunity gaps Um which are now controversial, even in talking about, to really talking about livability and longevity Mm -hmm. apps. Mm -hmm. And who gets to live a long life? And then what makes a long life livable Mm -hmm. and a good one? Uh, So that's number one. And I think about that when I'm making parenting decisions right now. So if, if my children, you know, I let them play, Um, I let them really focus on relationships with family right now, um, with less stress toward cramming content down their throat, because it's going to be a long life, I hope. Number two was increased conviction, deep conviction, that there is often a gap between 
what it means to graduate from high school and what it means to be ready for life after it. And that if we're going to really do the work, we need to invest deeply in all of you teachers and counselors and coaches and parents to get you this information so you even know what is changing and you can be agents of that change and get the training and upskilling and support you need to do a good job and to do right by your kids. And so that um, really deepened understanding Uh, was really important. The third piece connected to that is, I say this in the foreword, that um, through all of the writing and understanding how the workplace and college and everything is changing, the two things that really stuck out to me as most important out of all of it were um, social connections And um, I think that they're the, the most important currency, actually, of the four. Maybe I mean, competencies is a stiff competitor, but um, it was crazy how much social currency matters um, and that a lot of the extras, the things we consider enrichments and extracurriculars are actually the most important. Um, so, you know, I set out to write this book about education and I feel like I came out with a book about youth development mm. and really advocating for music and the arts and theater and creating things and making things. Um, and that was an evolution that surprised even me. That's fantastic. So Stephanie Malia Kraus, author of Making It, which was just released today and is available on multiple platforms, including Amazon.com. Thank you for being on the show today. And I'm already looking forward to part two of our interview. We'll figure out something really creative to do for that part, maybe in front of a live audience of some sort, um, but we'll figure it out and get it scheduled as soon as possible. Thank you very much for this time. I appreciate it so much, Josh, and I look forward to the next conversation. 